Let's turn now to the 23rd chapter of Ezekiel. Now, as a background for the 23rd chapter, which does have its difficulties, it is necessary to know that God was seeking a nation, a people, that would be a special people upon the earth. They were to be an exclusive kind of a nation in different ways. Number one, they were to be God's people and be dedicated wholly to God. God purposed that through this nation he would bring the Messiah into the world. And thus it was necessary for them to remain as a pure seed, a pure nation, in order that through them the Messiah may come. God looked at his relationship to Israel much as a husband-wife relationship. God had made a covenant of marriage to them. He had committed himself to them. In like manner, he desired that they commit themselves to him, as in a marriage, holy unto the Lord, completely his, as he gave himself for and to them to be their God. Thus, any deviation in their part in the worship of other gods or in the mingling with other nations and their gods, it constituted a spiritual kind of adultery. Uh, they're, they're joining themselves to other gods, other uh, forms of worship, uh, was looked upon by God as spiritual adultery. And thus he calls them uh, the adulteresses. He accuses them of whoredom when they uh, turn from him and they are worshiping other gods. They were to be exclusively gods. They were to be his people. And uh, so as we are coming now, to the end of the line, the northern kingdom of Israel has already been taken captive by the Assyrians and spread through the world. The southern kingdom is on the final legs. It's, it's about to go into the final siege by the Babylonian army, and it is going to also be dispersed into the world. Uh, and... Uh, so God lays out in the 23rd chapter his charge against Israel. And basically, it is a charge of unfaithfulness from the beginning. Even while they were in Egypt, though they were descendants of Abraham, they had begun to embrace the worship in Egypt, the worship of the Egyptian gods. And thus, even before they were brought out uh, of Egypt, uh, they were guilty of, of uh, adultery in a spiritual sense, of fornication. God brought them into the wilderness, and there God revealed himself, made his covenant, and then brought them into the land. Now, we know that they became divided into two nations after the death of Solomon, so that you had Ephraim, the northern kingdom, known as Israel, and you had Judah, the southern kingdom, uh, continuing with the uh, Davidic line of kings. Now, God calls them Ahola and Aholabah. He said they are sisters. Uh, they are the daughters of one mother, but they committed whoredoms in 
Egypt. That's where they first began to prostitute themselves. And uh, that is where they first began to be drawn and attracted to other gods, other forms of worship. Now, the name Ahola means her tent. The name Ahola Ba means my tent is in her. Now, the tent is used for the word for the tabernacle, the place where they met God. It was the place of worship. So in the northern kingdom, they established their places of worship in the city of Bethel, and the city of Dan. Basically, Jero uh, Jeroboam uh, set up these altars in these two cities to keep the people from the northern kingdom from returning to Jerusalem to worship in Jerusalem. He felt that if they go back to Jerusalem, they see the temple, they get involved in the holidays there, that soon they will be turning their loyalties back to uh, the kingdom of Judah. And thus he established uh, two altars, one in the northern part, the city of Dan, one in Bethel, the southernmost part of the northern kingdom. And he there actually put golden calves, uh, a part of the worship of Egypt. And he said, now these are your gods. And uh, the people... Uh, worshipped in these two cities that were established by Jeroboam. And uh, the northern kingdom went immediately into idolatry. And so God calls her Ahola, that is, it's her tent. It does, God doesn't recognize it as his place of meeting with them. However, Ahola Ba is, my tent is in her. That is, Jerusalem was the place that God established for uh, the people to gather to worship him and to meet with him. And thus Aholabah, uh, the younger sister, uh, Judah, it was the smaller. There were ten tribes in the northern kingdom, only two in the southern kingdom. And so Ephraim was called the older sister, uh, Judah the younger sister. And uh, so uh, they began their adulterous practices in Egypt before God ever brought them out. But when the northern kingdom was established, uh, the people became attracted to the Assyrians and to the worship of the Assyrians. Now, basically, the Assyrians uh, worshipped Ashtoreth, who was the female uh, goddess of sex. And... Uh, Thus, the worship of Ashtoreth involved licentious sexual orgies. And these people of God, the northern kingdom, were attracted by these, and they began to uh, give themselves over to these uh, sexual orgies uh, that, in, that uh, actually were a part of the whole worship of Ashtoreth. So the Lord speaks of Ahola, verse 5, who played the harlot, prostitute, when she was mine. And she doted on her lovers, on the Assyrians, her neighbors, which were clothed with blue, the captains and the rulers, all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding upon horses. And she committed her whoredoms with them, and all of them that were the chosen men of Assyria, with all of those she doted, and all of their idols she defiled herself. So they embraced the religion of the Assyrians. And neither did she leave her whoredoms that she brought from Egypt. They were still worshiping the golden calves that were set up in Bethel. And thus uh, many gods, idolatry, uh, all forms of pagan worship practiced by the northern kingdom of Israel. Now... As you go back in the book of the Kings and uh, the book of the Chronicles, as you deal with the uh, northern kingdom of Israel, uh, we read uh, uh, in their successive kings, and they did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And they followed after the sins of Jeroboam. 
and they built altars and they built the high places for worship and and they worshiped the Ashereth and it and it gives all of the uh, sins uh, which was actually a turning away from the worship of God and the worshiping of uh, these false gods of the pagans uh, around them and so uh, here was Israel totally defiled turning away completely from God and giving her love uh, to these other religious systems Wherefore, the Lord said, because of this, I have delivered her into the hands of her lovers, into the hand of the Assyrians upon whom she doted. She loved Assyria. She loved the worship of the Assyrians. So God said, all right, I'll just let you have, let the Assyrians take you. You can, you know, you can see what it is to, uh, you love them and, and you love their worship. So I'll let you just really see what it is. You know, they say that the grass on the other side of the fence is always greener. It's interesting that you see cows in a pasture and they may be in a green lush pasture, but they're always standing at the fence with their head between the bob wire trying to get the grass outside of the fence. Uh, it's just something about nature, animal nature, uh, that uh, that which is sort of, you know, prohibited always seems to be more attractive. But yet when you really get into it, uh, you find that it's, it's quite miserable. Uh, the interesting thing is that communism actually attracted many people in the United States. Uh, there were many people that looked at communism in Russia and they thought, my, wouldn't it be wonderful to be on an equal par with everybody, you know, and, and, and they saw communism as a real ideal. And, and these people were sort of idealists. And, and they were attracted to communism. But the thing was, they had never lived under a communistic system. They really didn't know what it was. They only uh, read, you know, the, the ideals of communism, and, and they, they were drawn by that. But many of them actually moved to Russia. They uh, canceled their U.S. citizenship. They said, you know, I am a communist. I, I'll live in Russia. But boy, after a while, uh, when you're living with it, you find it's a, it's a horse of a different color. It isn't all that it's made up to be. And uh, we see now the horrible uh, consequences of, of the communistic experience uh, or experiments in Russia. And uh, here they were drawn, they were attracted. Uh, Assyrians, they looked so powerful on their horses in that blue, the captains with that glorious blue uh, armament and all, and, and the people were attracted to the Assyrians. There was something about the worship and all that they were attracted to it. God said, okay, you, you think that's great? I'll just let you, uh, you know, you dote on them. I'll let you live with them for a while. I'll let you be uh, taken captive by them and, and realize really how totally heartless and cruel these people are. You know, God is a God of love. And, and God wants us to love. And through this love, be kind, be compassionate, be forgiving. Uh, and the two great commandments is love God with everything and your neighbor like yourself. And, and that's the basis of, of uh, the relationships with God. It's a loving relationship. When you get away from the Christian influence and you get away from the love, it's amazing how cruel man can be. We talk about the innate goodness of man, but the Bible speaks of the innate evil of man. I would, I would challenge you, go over to Bosnia and, and try to preach to the people about the innate goodness of man. Go into any war area and, and try to tell the people of the innate goodness of man. See how well received your message will be. Man is cruel. I cannot in my wildest imagination, 
conceive the atrocities that man perpetrates on fellow man. I cannot understand the mindset that would do the cruel things that man does to his fellow man. And the Assyrians were about as cruel a people who ever lived. You see, there was no basis in their religion for kindness, for love, for compassion. In their religious system, much as in communism, everybody's out for himself. You get what you can for yourself. And when you have that kind of mentality of all for me, then you begin to steal, you begin to take by force, uh, you begin to uh, connive and defraud and cheat, and, and all of these things come into play. And you find out it is a very cruel world, it is a very mean world, when you get outside of the Christian influence in the world. And so here they were drawn and attracted by the Assyrians. And God said, all right, you think that's so wonderful? You dote on them, you, you dream, you fantasize of, oh my, how wonderful, you know. And so they came. Verse 10, they discovered her nakedness. They took her sons and her daughters and they slew her with a sword. And she became infamous. Since they should put an in in front of that famous. She became infamous among women. For they had executed judgment upon her. That is, God's judgment was executed upon Aholabah. And when, or, uh, Hola. and when her sister Aholabah saw this, the southern kingdom, when they saw the results of uh, the sin... And the worship of these gods in the northern kingdom, it should have been an eye-opener to them. They should have uh, said, wow, look at the consequences of, of leaving God and turning away from God. And it should have been an uh, incentive for them to devote themselves fully and completely unto God. But when Aholabah the Judah saw what had happened, she became even more corrupt in her inordinate love that, than her older sister Ahola, and in her whoredoms more than her sister. And she doted upon the Assyrians and her neighbors, the captains, the rulers that were clothed most gorgeously, Horsemen riding upon horses, all of them desirable young men. And then I saw that she was defiled. And she increased her whoredoms, for she saw men portrayed upon the walls. They, they were looking at the pictures of the Babylonians, uh, the Babylonian army, the images of the Chaldeans that were portrayed in beautiful reddish colors. They were girded with girdles upon their loins, exceeding in dyed attire upon their heads, and all of them princes to look at. And after the manner of the Babylonians of Chaldea, the land of their nativity. And as soon as she saw them with her eyes, she doted upon them and sent messengers unto them into Chaldea. So the southern kingdom became attracted by Babylon. Now, you remember the scripture tells us at the time of Hezekiah, when he was sick and almost died, he prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord touched him and gave him another 10 years. He recovered from that illness, and he lived for another 10 years. And there came to Hezekiah, messengers from Babylon with uh, 
words of uh, greeting and congratulations that he had recovered from his illness. The Babylonian king sent these uh, heads of state, ambassadors and all, down to Hezekiah uh, with messages of uh, congratulation and all. And while they were there, Hezekiah showed to them all of the wealth of Judah. Uh, the wealth in the temple, the gold, the silver, the uh, vessels that were there. And he, and he sort of, in a bragging way, just showed him all of the wealth. And when these men went back, the prophet of God came to him and Hezekiah and said, you know, who were these fellows that were here? They said, well, they were guys from Babylon. He said, what did you show them? He said, well, I showed them all, all, everything we have, all of the treasuries and all. And he said, they are going to come and they're going to take away all of the treasures that you have displayed to them. It will linger in their mind. They'll say, oh, man, remember all of that. And ultimately, of course, Babylon did come. But uh, this, is, uh, this is that attraction. Now, it must be acknowledged that sin is very attractive. It looks very exciting. It seems very pleasurable. On the outward side, sin looks exceedingly glamorous. Hollywood makes sin look like fantasy world and so exciting and so wonderful. It has a very shiny veneer, but inside it's horrible. Like Jesus said, the outside is like, they're like whitewashed sepulchers. Uh, the burial sepulchers, they would whitewash them. They looked so nice and neat and clean as they were whitewashed on the outside. But he said, within, they're filled with dead men's bones. They're putrid. And so sin looks so glamorous and exciting on the outside, but boy, once you get entangled in it. And so Babylon was attractive. They saw the pictures of these Babylonians. They thought, oh my, look at that, you know, gorgeous, handsome young men, you know, and uh, all of them like princes. And so the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love, and they defiled her with their whoredom, and she was polluted with them, and her mind was alienated from them. So she discovered her whoredoms and discovered her nakedness, and then my mind was alienated from her, like as my mind was alienated from her sister. So alienation uh, from God is the result of this playing with sin. Uh, you become alienated from the life of God, a terrible position to be in. Yet she multiplied her whoredoms in calling to remembrance the days of her youth, wherein she played the harlot in the land of Egypt. For she doted upon their paramours, whose flesh is like the flesh of donkeys. Thus thou callest to remembrance the lewdness of thy youth, the things that transpired in Egypt, your uh, beginning of your dabbling with uh, the other gods and the other forms of worship. Therefore, O Aholabah, Judah, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will raise up thy lovers against thee from whom thy mind is alienated, and I will bring them against thee on every side, the Babylonians and all of the Chaldeans, Pekod and Shoah and Koah and all of the Assyrians with them and all of them desirable young men, captains, rulers, great lords and renowned, all of them riding on their horses, but they will come against you with their chariots and their wagons and the wheels and the assembly of people and they will set against you the buckler and the shield and the helmet and I will set judgment before them and they shall judge you according to their judgment. You want them, you're drawn to them, you're attracted to them, all right, I'll turn you over to them and let you realize the consequences. And I will set my jealousy against thee 
and I will deal furiously with thee, and they shall take away thy nose and thine eyes, and the remnant shall fall by the sword, and they shall take thy sons and thy daughters, and the residue shall be devoured with fire. You want them? You're drawn to them? All right, I'll let you find out what they're really about. The cruelty of the Assyrians. In history, uh, you have the records uh, and the pictures of the Assyrians leading the captives of war back to Assyria. In the pictures of the people being led as captives, their faces have been mutilated. The Assyrians would cut off their noses. They would cut off their ears. They would gouge out their eyes. And then they would put hooks through a person's nose and they would lead them on a leash with the hook through the nose. These are the kind of people you're attracted to, God said. You're falling in love with them. You think they're so wonderful. You think they're so great. All right, I'll let you just live with them. I'll turn you over to them, and you'll find out what it's really all about. And so God allowed then the southern kingdom also to go captive unto the Babylonians, to the Assyrians. And they will strip you from your clothes. They'll take away your fair jewels. They took, of course, the treasure. Thus will I make thy lewdness to cease from thee and thy whoredoms brought from the land of Egypt, so you shall not lift up your eyes unto them nor remember Egypt anymore. I'll give you a real dose of it, so much that it'll make you sick and you'll never want it again. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will deliver you into the hand of them whom you hate, into the hand of them from whom your mind is alienated, and they shall deal with you hatefully. They'll take away all of your labor, that is, all, you know, you, everything that you work for will be lost. And they shall leave you naked and bare, and the nakedness of your whoredom shall be discovered, both your lewdness and your whoredom. And I will do these things unto you because, because thou hast gone a whoring after the heathen and because thou art polluted with their idols. You know, one of the worst things that God can do for people sometimes is give them what they want. Give them what they're attracted to. And, and sometimes that's the worst thing that could ever happen to you. Is God say, okay, you want that? You're insisting on that? All right, you can have it. And man, that's, that's oftentimes just a, a day of real tragedy when, when God gives you that which you're lusting after, that which you're desiring. It can be a day of destruction. So I will do these things unto you because you've gone a whoring after the heathen and because you are polluted with their idols, the pollution of the heathen practices. I really could not in a mixed crowd tell you of the abominations of, of the practices in the worship of these pagan gods. Uh, and God said, you're drawn to that, you're attracted to that. I'll, I'll turn you over to it. For you have walked in the way of your sister, the northern kingdom of Samaria. Therefore, I will give her cup into your hand, the cup of judgment that she received, you will also receive. And you will drink of your sister's cup deep and large. And you shall be laughed to scorn. You'll be held in derision because it contains much, the cup of God's wrath and judgment. Thou shalt be filled with drunkenness and sorrow and with the cup of astonishment and desolation with the cup of your sister Samaria. And you will drink it, and drink it to the bottom. And you shall break the shreds thereof and pluck off thine own breast for i have spoken it saith the lord god therefore thus saith the lord god because you have forgotten me now god gives the the charges this is the indictment you've forgotten me you've cast me behind your back therefore bear thou also thy lewdness and thy whoredoms it is a tragic day in the history of any nation when that nation tries to turn its back upon God. I, 
I should have brought it tonight. I didn't, but um, I have a, a, a list of rulings by the Supreme Court and by the federal courts uh, that have come forth in the last uh, uh, 40 years, since 1947. Uh, and some of these rulings are appalling. Uh, we need to pray and pray earnestly for our nation. The Supreme Court is almost turned around. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, uh, we're going to see some changes in the decisions made by the Supreme Court. But some of the decisions under the Warren Court are just devastating as far as uh, ruling God out of our national life. An interesting ruling of, of the court is that a teacher cannot read the prayers that were offered in Congress and in the Senate at the beginning of the sessions. They can't be read in the public school, though they are a part of the congressional record. I mean, all kinds of decisions through the courts as, as they are turning our back nationally on God. That was the mistake of Judah. You have forgotten me. You have turned your back on me in order that you might indulge in your lewdness and in your whoredoms. And the Lord said, Moreover unto me, Son of man, will you judge Ahola and Aholabah? Yes, you will. Declare unto them their abominations, that they have committed adultery. Blood is on their hands. With their idols they have committed adultery. They have caused their sons whom they bore unto me to pass for them through the fire to devour them. They threw their children into the fires unto Molech. Human sacrifice. Something that God said was an abomination unto him. And yet here they were practicing it. God's people. I've given you these beautiful sons, but yet you've thrown them in the fire unto Molech that they might be devoured. Moreover, this day they have done unto me, they have defiled my sanctuary in the same day, and they profane my Sabbath. For they have slain their children to their idols, and then they came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it, and lo, thus have they done in the midst of my house. Horrible, unthinkable. They would go to the pagan worships of Molech, and they would take their children and throw them in the fire to uh, appease their god of pleasure. You see, uh, Molech, the god of pleasure, along with Ashtoreth, the, the sexual goddess, and, and sort of the, the goddess of pornography. So as a result of the pornography, there was a heightened sexual stimulus. And the people were stimulated sexually because of, of all of the pornography of, of Ashtoreth. And uh, they were worshiping Molech, the god of pleasure. And so there was all kinds of lewd, lascivious uh, worship rites uh, involving sexual intercourse. And... Uh, as a result, there were a lot of unwanted babies. A lot of babies being born that no one wanted. And so, uh, because these were conceived as they were worshiping in these pagan rites, uh, they would bring these babies then to these bonfires that were built, and they would toss the babies into the bonfires. And then they would go to the temple to worship God. God said, you know, you go out and you kill your babies and then you come in here and, and, and sit in my temple. You profane my temple. 
coming in that condition. The very same day that you sacrificed your child, you would come in. And furthermore, you have sent for men to come from far unto whom a messenger was sent, and lo, they came, for you did wash thyself, you painted your eyes, you decked yourself with ornaments, you sought to make yourself attractive to uh, these foreigners. And you sat on a stately bed, and you prepared a table, whereupon you have set mine incense and my oil. And the voice of a multitude being at ease was with her, and with the men of the common sort were brought the Sabians from the wilderness. And they put their bracelets. In other words, they just completely polluted themselves. Anybody. Everybody. They were willing to lie with. And they went in unto her as they go into a woman that is playing the harlot. So they came unto a hole and unto a hole about the lewd women. And the righteous men... They shall judge them after the manner of adulteresses and after the manner of women that shed blood because they are adulteresses and blood is in their hands. They will be judged in righteousness. For thus saith the Lord God, I will bring up a company upon them and I will give them to be removed and spoiled. And the company shall stone them. Now, under the law, if you committed adultery, you were stoned to death. If you committed murder, you were stoned to death. And so God said, I, the righteous men will uh, fulfill the law in that they will be stoned. So I will bring up the company and they will stone them and they will dispatch them with their swords. They shall slay their sons and their daughters. They will burn their houses with fire. And thus will I cause lewdness to cease out of the land that all of the women may be taught not to do after your lewdness. And they shall recompense your lewdness upon you and you shall bear the sins of your idols and ye shall know that I am the Lord God. Uh, verse 43, I think we skipped over that. It's an interesting thing. It's actually when they were old, old prostitutes, worn out. And yet they continued, you know, uh, in, their, in their adulterous practices. Uh, I said unto her that was old in adulteries. Will they now commit whoredoms with her? Uh, old and worn out, but uh, yet uh, to the end, unfaithful unto God, deserving the judgment of God. So again in the ninth year, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, write the name of this day, even this same day, for the king of Babylon set himself against Jerusalem on this day. Now you go back to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 51, and Jeremiah tells you that on the, uh, in the ninth year of the king of uh, the reign of King Zedekiah, in the tenth month and the tenth day of the month, came the Babylonian army unto Jerusalem and began the siege. Now here is Ezekiel 400 miles away without any means of communication like we have today. This doesn't seem to us to be such a big thing, you know, because we have telephones, we have radios, we have all kinds of ways of communicating news across the world. But in those days they didn't. They had only messengers to go by horse. Uh, and it would take weeks to get a message from uh, Jerusalem to Babylon. But yet there in Babylon, here's Jeremiah marking the calendar and pointing to the people. This is the day that the siege has begun in Jerusalem. This is the day that marks the beginning of the end. Jerusalem is going to surely fall, and this day marks the beginning of the siege. So that God is showing his ability, knowing all things, to reveal to the prophet Ezekiel, 400 miles away in Babylon, the very day that the siege began in Jerusalem. Confirmed by 
the prophecies of Jeremiah who was in Jerusalem, who was recording it as history, whereas uh, Ezekiel 400 miles away is uh, receiving it as a divinely inspired a message from God. Utter this parable unto this rebellious house, say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Set on a pot, big boiling pot, pour water into it, and gather pieces of the flock, the, the, the lamb out of the flock, and put it into the pot, every good piece, the thigh, the shoulder, and fill it with choice bones. And take the choice of the flock and burn also the bones under it. They used to use bones for fire when they would be short on wood. And make it boil well. And let it seethe the bones in it. And therefore thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose scum is in it and whose scum is not gone out of it. Bring it out piece by piece and let no lot fall on it. It used to be that you'd take your sacrifice to the priest, uh, certain peace offerings, they would boil it and then they would pull out the flesh and, and they would uh, cast lots and this goes to you, this goes to the priest and, and all. But he said, just pull it out, don't cast lots on it. For her blood is in the midst of her she set it up upon the top of a rock. She poured it not on the ground to cover it with dust. Uh, normally, when you sacrifice something uh, or killed an animal, slaughtered an animal, you would pour the, ground, the blood on the ground and then you'd cover it with dirt uh, as a uh, means of uh, hygiene. It was part of the law. But the blood poured on a rock, not covered with dirt, that it might cause fury to come up and take vengeance, for I have set her blood on the top of a rock that it should not be covered. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city of Jerusalem! I will even make the pile for the fire great. Heap on the wood, kindle the fire, consume the flesh, spice it well, and let the bones be burned. Uh, when, you, when the water goes out and you've got just the, uh, the bones and all in there beginning to burn, they smell horrible as, as they begin to burn. Uh, as you boil bones, there is a certain uh, scum that forms on the top of the boiling. And uh, this, this scum is usually taken off. You're making the broth and all, you, you take off the top, that scum that forms but just leave it there and just keep boiling it until the, the water is gone and just burn the bones and burn the scum. Uh, and set it empty upon the coals thereof, the, the big pot, with, uh, just that the brass of it may become just hot and may burn, that the filthiness of it may be just molded into it. Uh, that it just becomes a part of the metal, just burn it until it's black and just, you know, uh, becomes sort of fuses into the metal itself. That the filthiness of it may be just molten into it, that the scum of it may be consumed. For she hath wearied herself with lies, and her great scum went not forth out of her, her scum shall be in the fire. In thy filthiness is lewdness, because I have washed you, but you were not washed. And you shall not be washed from your filthiness anymore, till I have caused my fury to rest upon you. God said, I've sought to cleanse you, I've worked with you, but you went right back to your filth. You wouldn't be cleansed of your filth. How God longs for your life to be pure. How God longs for you to be holy, to walk in purity and to walk in holiness. And how patient God is uh, when we become marred and despoiled by sin to just wash us and cleanse us, to lift us up out of the mud and to wash us off and, and to set us again, you know, 
on a solid footing, but people just go right back over and over again, right back into the same pollution from which God has, has taken them out. And, and God, God finally said just, you know, I'm through. I'm not going to try to wash you anymore. I'm just going to let you go in your filthiness until you've been judged. You receive the recompense of this. God spared them so long. You see, there, there are actions that bring natural, inevitable consequences. Now, if you jump off of a roof, you're defying the law of nature. You may get by with it a few times. But ultimately, you go higher and higher and higher, you know. Ultimately, God says, okay, <laughs> I won't hold you up this time. I'll let you crash. I'll let you, I'll let you experience the consequences of this. People dabble around with drugs, and, and God is so gracious in, in helping them, in, in, in you know, dealing with them, drawing them away from it, that they go back, they go back, until finally God says, okay, that's what you want, go for it. And again, allowing you to do those things that your heart is inclined to do. But then you now re receive and you begin to realize what these things actually do, the damage, the, the destructive power that they actually have. And God allows you to see it. He will shield you for a while. He's patient. But there comes an end to the patience of God, the long-suffering of God, and, and to the protection that God gives to you. And, and ultimately, he'll let you, if you continue and persist in your sin, he'll let you begin to experience the real consequence of that sin. Though you've been protected and shielded for a time, finally God will say, okay, that's it. Uh, you'll learn your lesson, and, and he'll let you really taste of the uh, bitterness of that sin that you've been attracted to and drawn to. And then, oh, your life becomes so miserable. Uh, you, you just, you, you feel like you're in hell. And, and in a sense, I think you are experiencing some of the torments of hell as you begin to reap the natural consequences of, of that sin that you've been doting on and, and uh, dabbling with. And so, God said, I'm just going to let you reap the consequences. You're going to be burned until I've caused all of my fury to rest upon thee. I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass. I will do it. I will not go back. Now, many, many times God went back. People would plead. They'd turn to God and God say, okay. And he's patient. He's forgiving. He's loving. But God said, I'm not going to change this time. You, you've gone too far. According to your ways. You see, it's the natural consequence of the, of the path you've chosen. According to your ways, according to your doings, you will be judged, saith the Lord God. It's time that people wake up to the fact that God has given to us rules and laws for a good life, for good relationships with him and a good relationship with others. He's laid down the rules. These rules are oftentimes looked upon by us as too restrictive. And we defy those laws, those rules. We go beyond the borders that God has prescribed. And when we do, and when we persist in going beyond the borders, then God often allows us to begin to reap the consequences and the misery and the suffering that he was trying to protect us from. At the present time, 
there is a multitude of terrible sexually transmitted diseases in our country. Not just AIDS. There are all types of sexually transmitted diseases. Herpes, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and a multitude. And uh, new strains of gonorrhea that are resistant to the old uh, medicines that we've been able to use. New strains of syphilis. Now, if you're not engaging in promiscuous sexual act, if you're obeying the scripture, you don't have to worry about one of these horrible diseases that are being transmitted by uh, promiscuous sex. You see, you don't have to worry about all these horrible things that are out there, these horrible viruses and, and all that are, that are being transmitted by uh, sex. You don't have to worry about them as, as long as you're obeying the word of God. You're being true to your wife and, and true to that relationship, right? You have no worries. But I'll tell you what, if you're a very sexually active person, then you've got a lot to worry about. You see, you're, you're defying the laws of God. Now, God may protect you for a time. God may keep you for a time, and he may not. We have many people in the church who have AIDS. Some of them declared that they received it by one outside of marriage encounter. Maybe you say, well, I've been lucky. No, God's been gracious to you, but he won't always be. And you keep defying the law of God, and sooner or later, you're going to find yourself inflicted with one of these sexually transmitted diseases that you'll probably have and need to be treated the rest of your life. As a person is suffering the consequences of these sexually transmitted diseases, I wonder if when they're in the final stages, if you go and say, hey, was it worth it? Pretty exciting night, huh? Pretty thrilling, huh? But look at you now. Was it really worth it? God gave us laws to protect us. You defy those laws and you're open. You're open game. And God isn't always going to protect you. And so God said, you know, all right, you've gone too far. I've spoken of the judgment. It's going to come to pass. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to go back. I'm not going to change. You're going to receive the things that come as a consequence of the things that you've been doing. I'm not going to protect you any longer. I'm not going to shield you any longer. But you know what the ridiculous thing is? When a person begins to suffer the consequences of their own sin, they always want to blame God. Why would God allow this to happen to me? Well, hey, wait a minute. You've been defying the law of God. You've been doing the things God told you not to do. Why blame God for it? God's not the one responsible for the consequences. He was doing everything to keep you from it, warning you, and you were ignoring him. So the word of the Lord came again in verse 15 to Ezekiel. And it said, Son of man, behold, I take away from you the desire of your eyes with a stroke. It's interesting. God would refer to his wife as the desire of his eyes. That should be the truth of every husband. His wife should be the desire of his eyes. I love that phrase. And God said, I'm going to take her away from you with a stroke. 
Yet you're not to mourn or weep, neither shall you allow tears to run down your cheeks. Don't cry. Don't make any mourning for the dead. But put your turban on your head. Don't put on uh, ashes, but put your turban on your head. Put your shoes on your feet. And cover not your lips. And don't eat the bread of men. So I spake, spoke to the people in the morning, told the people what God had told them, and in the evening, his wife died. And I did as the Lord commanded me in the morning. And so the people said to me, Will you not tell us what these things are to us, what you are doing? So I answered them, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, uh, it's interesting, he was doing things that provoked questions. You know, it's interesting, a lot of times people ask the right questions. If you're doing the right thing, people ask the right questions. And the questions give you the opportunity of sharing. You know, I watched you and you, you know, didn't get upset when that guy said that to you. How come, you know, he, he, you didn't really, I mean, you really had the guy. You couldn't, how come, you know? Hey, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> You know, it gives you that opportunity to share the truth of God with people when your life is, is walking circumspectly before the Lord, walking in the Spirit. It, it creates good questions which create good opportunities for you to share what God has done. So they question him. How come? You're not mourning. You're not crying. There are no tears. And I answered them, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Speak to the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary. That is the temple in Jerusalem. It's going to be destroyed. The excellency of your strength, the strength of the nation, is in its relationship with God. And, and the temple representing the place where the people met God. The excellency of the strength of the nation going to be destroyed. The desire of your eyes, oh, how they prided themselves in that glorious temple. And in, in captivity, they, they kept thinking about the temple and, and, and the place of the worship of God and, and all. And it was just sort of the heart of the nation from a physical, but unfortunately not a spiritual standpoint. And your sons and your daughters who you have left behind in Jerusalem are going to fall by the sword. And you shall do as I have done, Ezekiel is telling them. You're not to cover your lips. You're not to eat the bread of men. You're to put your turbans on your heads, your shoes on your feet. You're not to mourn or weep. But you shall pine away for your iniquities and mourn one toward another. In other words, don't cry for the dead. Cry for yourself and cry for your iniquities, the sin that has provoked this judgment of God. And thus Ezekiel is unto you a sign. According to all that he has done, so shall you do. And when this comes, you will know that I am the Lord. When the word comes to you that Jerusalem is fallen, your children have been slain, the temple destroyed, then you'll know that I am the Lord that has spoke this to you. Also, thou son of man, shall it not be in the day when I take from them their strength and the joy of their glory, the desire of their eyes, and that whereon they have set their minds, their sons and their daughters, when I've destroyed Jerusalem, the temple, their children, that he that escapes in those days and comes to bring you the message, to cause you to hear with your ears what has happened, in that day shall your mouth be opened to him which is escaped. And thou shalt speak and be no more uh, silent. And thou shalt be a sign unto them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. This is the last prophecy to the adulterous nation. As we go into the next chapter, he's going to prophesy against the nations round about Israel. He'll prophesy against Tyre. He'll prophesy against the Ammonites and all. And no more prophecies to the people of God until the news comes 
that Jerusalem has been destroyed, the temple has been wiped out, everybody's been slain, you know, and, and they hear the horrible news. And then he begins to prophesy again. But the interesting thing, as he begins to prophesy again, he'll prophesy of the future glory that God is going to bring upon these people who've been wiped out in judgment. Oh, the stubborn love of God. You know, he just won't let go. And they have failed. They're reaping the judgment. And, and God has said his final word. It's going to happen. I'm not going to change. It's, it, you know, the, it, it's, it's, it's set. And, and that's it. No more word. No more message. Silent. Until the day comes when they tell you everything is gone. It's all wiped out. The temple. Everybody's been killed and all. And then you're to open up your mouth. You begin to prophesy again. But you'll prophesy of God's glorious glory that he will pour upon the nation in the latter days. How God will begin again a work. God will bring them back into the land and God will establish them there. And, and, and so as you get into the latter part of Ezekiel, it, it's the things that are happening today in Israel, the regathering of the nation and the things that will transpire, and then the glorious new temple that we will be built, uh, the worship again that will take place within Jerusalem, and, and you go out into the yet things that are yet future now. Some of the latter part has already been fulfilled. You get into chapters 36, 37, they're already fulfilled. Chapter 38 is about to be fulfilled, and, and it just goes on out now to the glorious future that God has for these people who failed him so miserably. You know, sometimes we fail, fail rather miserably. But God's final word to us is not of judgment and failure, but it is of the glorious kingdom that he's prepared for us as we follow after Jesus Christ and as we seek after him. It's really, no great sin to fall in the mud. The sin is lying there. You know, if you fall, get up. Let the Lord wash you off. Keep going. Don't wallow in it. Don't just lie there in it. Because then it is sin. John said, my little children, I write unto you that you sin not. But if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Yes, ideally, it would be wonderful if we didn't sin. But the truth of the matter is we do. And John, writing to them, said, if you say you have no sin, you just deceive yourself. The truth isn't in you. But if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Yes, we fail. But God is gracious and God is kind and God is love and God is forgiving. And he washes us. And he holds us by the hand to sustain us and to keep us. So we've come to sort of the end of this portion of the book of Ezekiel. The next portion will be prophecies and fascinating prophecies against Tyre. And um, you'll, you'll see some fascinating things as we uh, look at these prophecies against these nations, and as we then look at what history tells us. And uh, next week especially, chapter 26, how that uh, the prophecy of Ezekiel is so exacting with what history records of the destruction of Tyre. And uh, you'll, you'll see with what interesting exactness God speaks. And... Uh, then uh, as we get in into the future of Israel as God
begins again to work with them in preparing the nation for the second coming of his son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for your word and for the warnings that you give. We thank you for your law, a guide to life, for the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. And Lord, may we be wise and understanding in your ways, that we might walk, Lord, in your way in a life that is pleasing to you. Cleanse us, Lord. Wash us and we shall be clean. And Lord, give us that strength to stand against the powerful temptations of the world, the allurement and the enticement of the enemy. And Lord, may we live a life that is dedicated and committed to obedience to your commands. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? May the Lord strengthen your resolve to work, worship and to serve him fully and completely. And may this week be a week of spiritual growth and, and the work of God's Spirit within your life drawing you into that deeper and richer commitment unto the things of the Lord. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for